One thing that I just kind of wanted to start with is, you know, even though Hans Kiari described both Kiari one and two, and obviously three and four, which we won't really talk about, and they do have similarities, they're, they're very distinct entities, and certainly the populations in which they occur are really distinct. So while they do have a number of things in common, it's important to sort of recognize how different they really are. And um, so even though they have very similar sounding names, they're really quite different entities. And uh, just by way of example, which you probably heard last week, you know, Chiari 1, which is gonna be much more common, uh, happens with herniation of the cerebellar tonsils versus 2, which is herniation of the vermis, you know, more centrally located anatomical structure. And most patients who have Chiari 1 don't have a lot of other uh, associated conditions. So it's not something that's part of a greater syndrome in most cases, and, and we'll pretty much stick to your more sort of bread and butter stuff in this talk tonight. Whereas Chiari 2 is universally associated with myelomeningocele, and that obviously comes with a host of other signs and symptoms and, um, and neurological malformations. The most typical symptoms that you see with a Chiari 1 are, um, you know, posterior tuss of headaches. So headaches that you can bring on with coughing or sneezing, Valsalva maneuvers, laughing, playing, things like that, that are really focused in the back of the head and neck. Whereas while surgery for Chiari 2 decompression is becoming much less common than it used to be, the things that do lead to people doing it tend to be lower cranial neuropathies and brainstem dysfunction. And while you can have that with Chiari 1, that's you know, not the most common reason why we're doing those surgeries. In both of the, of the conditions, though, you can have syringomyelia, you can have scoliosis. In fact, that's incredibly common in kids with myelomeningocele. Um, but kids with myelomeningocele much more often have hydrocephalus, which you have to think about in the context of managing their Chiari. Um, so it's just important to kind of recognize this. And just in terms of looking at this with imaging, you can see the patient on the left has a Chiari 1, the patient on the right has Chiari 2. And of course, they both have what you would think about right off the bat, which is herniation of some aspect of the inferior cerebellum, the tonsils in the case of one, the vermis in the case of the other, uh, at the frame and magnum and into the um, cervical canal. However, then you start to see some differences. So while the rest of the brain of the patient with carry one is pretty normal, the patient with carry two has a number of other features that you can identify. So there's colossal dysgenesis, there's fusion of the colliculi. So that's that term beat tectum. That's what that is. You can see that the patient with the carry two has a low lying torquil herophili. And that's very important when you think about if you're doing suboccipital decompression, you know, how much bone are you taking before you potentially can get into structures that are really critical. So that's a really surgically anatomically relevant feature for these patients. Um, and as many of you are probably already aware, there's a number of other features that you see in the brains of patients with myelomeningocele and Chiari uh, too as well. So things like, you know, large fused mass intermedia or interdigitated gyri and things of that nature. And then I'll just sort of briefly mention uh, Chiari 1.5 and Chiari 0 because you'll see them come up. Uh, we won't talk about them a lot as individual entities, but the processes of how they're managed are very similar to Chiari 1. So the distinction between Chiari 1 and 1.5 is really the position of the obex. So you know, with the, with the Chiari 1, it's technically defined by herniation of the cerebellar tonsils by five millimeters below McRae's line, or, you know, the line that joins the, uh, the basion to the opistheon or the frame and magnum. Um, with Chiari 1.5, what you have is actually the positioning of the obex below that line. And so it's kind of a shifting of the brainstem down. And sometimes the term Chiari 5 is blended in with the term complex Chiari. And um, I think that can be a little bit of a challenge because it's just imprecision in the language. You don't necessarily know what you're talking about, but Chiari 1.5 is defined by that brainstem difference. Chiari 0, in, in my experience, has been a little bit of a Yeti. I don't think I've ever seen a patient with one. I, I haven't decompressed a patient with one, but the concept behind it is that you actually have Chiari-like physiology in a patient who doesn't have herniation of their tonsils. So you have potentially symptomatic syringomyelia uh, without actual tonsil herniation. And that can be treated by doing a posterior fossa decompression and opening up potential uh, arachnoid adhesions or something like that that's causing that type of physiology. So now getting back a little bit more to the outline that we had laid out before, the first question was really, you know, how do you make decisions about surveilling a patient versus intervening surgically? And like you'll find with you know, pretty much any medical condition that a physician takes care of, what you're really doing is putting together a puzzle to figure out what the best, you know, what the most 
accurate diagnosis is and what the most appropriate treatment is. So there's clinical pieces, there are imaging pieces, and there are potentially physiologic testing pieces that you can put together to come to a conclusion around these things. So the classic clinical pieces when you're evaluating a patient for Chiari malformation are uh, headache is number one. So, you know, is the headache occipitally located? Is the headache, as I mentioned before, is it a tussive headache? Is it an inducible headache? Uh, is it an intense headache that comes on really strongly when you cough and then goes away really quickly? So intense, short lasting. Those are sort of your classic textbook headaches that can be treated by surgical decompression of a Chiari if a Chiari is present. When people have migraines headaches, when they have cluster headaches, when they have frontal headaches, those aren't gonna get better with treatment of a Chiari, even if they do have a Chiari. So it's really critically important that you hone in and you recognize the details of headaches that can actually be treatable with our therapies for Chiari. Other things that are really common in terms of the clinical findings with patients with Chiari are you know, neck pain, myelopathy, which that's usually gonna come along with a syrinx or something like that. Uh, lower cranial nerve deficit, so that can come along with, gra- with brainstem compression and that can manifest as swallowing problems, sleep apnea, snoring, things of that nature. So those are sort of the clinical pieces that you're looking for. Periodically, you'll even see things like eye movement abnormalities or loss of reflexes. When it comes to imaging, obviously MRI scan is going to be the standard. And, you know, as we talked about before, you're looking for five millimeters of cerebellar tonsil herniation, although I'll talk about that in a little more detail uh, in a minute because increasingly the position of the OBEC seems to be uh, perhaps correlated more closely with actual symptomatic Chiari. One of the things that we see is there are a lot of people out there who have Chiari malformations by MRI criteria. There many of them are not symptomatic and don't require intervention. So that's one of the big pieces in terms of what we do. When you think about Chiari 2, obviously vermis herniation, you know, do you see a syrinx on an MRI scan? And then do you see scoliosis? And that's really best assessed with just a standard, you know, upright x-ray. So those are sort of the imaging features that you're looking for when you're putting this puzzle together. And then in terms of things like physiologic testing, you can get sleep studies. So it's not uncommon that I get a referral for a patient with a Chiari that's identified because they came in with a sleep problem. They had a sleep study that showed central sleep apnea that prompted the ear, nose, and throat physician, for example, to get an MRI, boom, they've got a Chiari and they come over to see me. So those can be really useful adjuncts in terms of diagnosing whether or not someone needs intervention, whether or not they're truly symptomatic. So you say, okay, I've got these puzzle pieces and I'm gonna put them together, but how do I know when I put them together, whether I should do surgery or recommend surgery or whether I should recommend observation or something else? So I think this sort of conventional wisdom, the way that I was taught and have practiced is that you can kind of think of it as two buckets of patients. So. Um, you have patients who have symptoms and patients who don't have symptoms. So among the ones who have symptoms, what are the symptoms that lead you to say, okay, surgery is the right thing for this patient. I can make this patient's life better by doing surgery. And so if they've got headaches that are really mild, maybe they have them like once every few months and they're not that bothersome. Well, do you really want to go through an operation in order to potentially treat that headache? Maybe not. But if you have headaches that are really impacting your quality of life, that are preventing you from doing things you want to do, that may be a circumstance where you do surgery to try to treat those headaches. And that, again, is kind of the most common reason why people present with symptomatic Chiari. And I also mentioned before some of the other symptoms. So myelopathy, if you've got central sleep apnea, uh, things of that nature are clearly symptoms that can be related to the Chiari and that can be either halted or reversed if you do surgery to decompress the Chiari. So those patients very often will merit an operative intervention. Then you have a group of patients who don't have symptoms and there are still some who benefit from having surgery. So a patient who may have a progressive, albeit asymptomatic scoliosis, that's somebody where if you potentially intervene appropriately, you can prevent them from having a continuing progressive scoliosis and you may be able to prevent them from needing to have a spine fusion, for example. Similarly, a progressive syrinx, like the patient you see in this picture, you know, she's basically asymptomatic over the course of a few years, she's had this progressive syrinx. And is that someone who you think, well, you know, maybe it's time to do a decompression on this patient. And then you get into sort of the risk benefit ratio associated with the surgery and intervening for something that is asymptomatic at the time. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.